This is African News Tonight on The Voice of America. Hello and welcome. Welcome to African News Tonight from the English to Africa service of The Voice of America, your source for Pan-African news and world developments. I'm Iheyes Wuhib in Washington. Coming up on African News Tonight... We want to focus and discuss why the transitional period has failed to achieve peace and transition to democracy. That's Pagan Amum, head of the South Sudan's real SPLM party on the president's decision to suspend peace talks. Details coming up. Also, the faithful are lining up to pay their respects to Pope Benedict. Separatists in Cameroon's western regions are enforcing a 24-hour curfew. And at least 20 people have been killed and dozens injured in Somalia's breakaway region of Somaliland. These stories and more on African News tonight. We start with our top story. Separatists in Cameroon's western regions are enforcing a 24-hour curfew, not allowing people on the streets or businesses to operate. The curfew was a response to President Paul Bia's New Year's Eve speech in which he said rebel groups have been crushed by government troops. Moki Edwin Kinzeka reports from Yaoundé, Cameroon. Cameroon's military says it deployed scores of troops to Oku, Kumbo and Jakiri districts Monday in the Central African state's English-speaking northwest region. The military says armed gangs over the weekend sealed markets, chased people and vehicles from the streets, and abducted scores of civilians who did not comply with their orders. 54-year-old motorcycle taxi driver Lukong Genesis says armed men seized his motorcycle. He says the separatists who call themselves Amazonians or Amba pointed guns at him and demanded he go home. The situation in Kumbu for the past two days has been very, very precarious. There has been serious gun firing between the Amba and the state forces. And uh, today, being Monday, the ghost town has been reinforced and the streets are dry. No movement of vehicles and people. Everybody's indoors. Lukong said battles between troops and rebels intensified after President Paul Beer's New Year's Eve speech. Beer said many rebel groups have been crushed and the threat from separatists has been significantly reduced. He praised the Central African state's military for protecting civilians and property during the six-year conflict and said peace would pave the way for the region's reconstruction. The rebels say they want to carve out an English-speaking state they call Ambazonia from Cameroon and its French-speaking majority. Capo Daniel is self-declared deputy defense chief of the Ambazonia Defense Forces, one of the rebel groups. He dismissed the allegation that their forces have been significantly reduced. That Pobia mentioned that peace is returning is lovable. Ambazonian control areas have largely increased. 19 Cameroon military men were targeted in Bui and some of them were airlifted for treatment. There have been some arson attacks by the Cameroon military in Bui as well as in Oku. Ambazonia will not give up their fight until we achieve our goal of independence. Cameroon's military admits that troops have been in running battles with rebels in several western towns and villages, but says their forces did not suffer any casualties. The military says it killed at least 11 separatists in battles in Kumbo and Oku, a claim which VOA could not independently confirm. Bernard Okala Bilai is governor of the English speaking Southwest region. Les agents perturbateurs viennent de la communauté. La communauté. He says civilians should denounce members of armed gangs and hoodlums causing havoc in the community to the military and government officials. Bilai says armed gangs are harassing people, stealing and abducting civilians for ransom, claiming it is a fight for freedom and liberation. The separatists deny their fighters are abducting and harassing civilians. Rebels on social media post Monday said their fighters were enforcing the curfew to counter Bia's claim that fighters were being defeated. 
Separatists in English-speaking Western Cameroon launched their rebellion in 2017 after what they said was years of discrimination by the country's French-speaking majority. Bia says Cameroon is indivisible and anyone attempting it will be crushed. The UN says the conflict has killed more than 3,500 people and displaced more than 750,000. Moki Edwin Kinzaka for VOA News, Yawundi, Cameroon. The faithful are lining up to pay their respects to Pope Emeritus uh, Benedict at St. Peter's Basilica, where he is lying in state. Some had been waiting for hours when the doors were finally opened. Benedict's body, dressed in traditional red liturgical garments with a mitre, will lie in state until Wednesday. Benedict, born Joseph Ratzinger, was 95 at the time of his death. On Thursday, Pope Francis will become the first pope in modern history to preside as pope at the funeral of his predecessor, according to the Vatican News website. In Uganda, Aloisil Ivan Kalenzi, the head of the Leyte office for the Kampala Archdiocese, was among those remembering the late pope. The late pope Benedict XVI, I would say, has been a devoted Christian, uh, who guided the church through some time, and maybe at times with a number of challenges, but he steered ahead of the church, and has been a committed person as far as leadership is concerned. But when he saw that he was weak, he became the first people, the, the first pope in over 600 years to step aside and give way to a new pope. I think that was also very courageous. Uh, many leaders, many popes, even other leaders, they die in the seat or when they are still ha ha handling the oaths, having the mantle of leadership. So it was also a unique pop in that area. But also, he's a pop whom you normally say emeritus, who has taken a quiet life after his designation, and he has spent most of the time praying for the church and not interrupting the stewardship of the new pope the current Pope Francis. You know, the, in leadership at times when you are there and you feel you are strong and have been leading, you feel maybe you know more than others and all the time you want to interrupt, intervene. But he has kept a low profile and let the current leadership handle the mantle of leadership of the Catholic Church. So I think that was a, something great and which I can remember about him. To me, it meant somebody who can, like me, I'm a head of late, but it does mean that I have to be permanent. I think I picked a lesson from him that, yes, you can leave the chair and others can steer on. And actually, I'm following that because I'm having my first term and the elections are near, but I'm going to step aside and you get new blood. So I think that's what it means to me that, yes, in leadership, there are many leaders who can come along. And in Uganda here, we have something where we have same leaders for so long and I think they should take a leave from that late pop. Roman Catholic nun Boni Concili Com Hangi was another who recalled Pope Benedict. I can describe Pope Benedict. Uh, he was a father to everybody. Being that he was a leader to the Catholic Church, but he was special in love. He loved the church, he loved the Catholic people, even non-Catholics. He was a real father, a real parent. Pope Benedict, he was a good leader. And that's why during his reign, he stepped aside. Because it seems he saw something. And he said, okay, I've been a leader in the Catholic Church, but anybody can come and lead. So he stepped aside, and uh, Pope Francis took over 
and he's our leader today. So we thank Pope Benedict. What he did, uh, at first it was a shock, especially to the Catholics. But uh, at the end, we saw it was uh, meaningful. And the Reverend Joseph Mary Sesbunia, the Chancellor of the Kampala Archdiocese, had these thoughts. Pope Benedict the Sixteen was one of the greatest brains, the greatest pops the church had ever had. Right from his childhood, he was a great theologian. In Germany, he was known. He was bishop of one of the biggest dioceses, Archbishop of Munich. That's the biggest Catholic diocese in Germany. And he managed to steer that until he came to Rome. All the time, he was a professor. He wrote many books. As a student in Rome and all of us doing theology, we all remember something about Pope Benedict, writing from a whole scope of theology. He was just an accomplished theologian. He could speak about almost anything, very lucidly, but very deep. Remember his last work he wrote to us, Jesus of Nazareth. People read it and read it, and up to now we're still reading and writing about it. It was so deep, and that's how deep he was in theology, in church history, in liturgy. He was a profound person, yet he always considered himself a humble servant in the vineyard of the Lord. And we thank him for having, at that age, uh, accepted to take up the mantle of Pope. As a student in Rome, I was blessed to meet him one-on-one. And one funny thing happened. I had my flag of Uganda. I remember those memories. I have that photo with me. I was waving the flag of Uganda. And as he came greeting the priests in Rome, he stopped by me and asked me in German. My German wasn't that good at that time. He says, are you German? And I look at a black German servant with a flag. I said, Holy Father, I'm Ugandan. And then he looked at my flag a few seconds and he observed. You know, the flag of Germany and Uganda are very close. It's black, here, red, but ours is twice. So he was happy and then like, how is Cardinal Amala? And that touched me because he never came to Uganda. But he had a memory of people from all over the world. He had a deep knowledge and consciousness of the universal church and the world. Benedict was Pope from April 2005 until February of 2013. He made history as the first Pope in 600 years to retire while in office. He resigned because he said his health impaired his ability to serve as the head of the church. South Sudan's President Salva Kiir has suspended peace talks with holdout rebel groups that had been taking place in Rome. Kiir says the holdout groups have continued to carry out activities that destabilize the country and says his government will only resume the talks when the rebels agree to engage in genuine negotiations. The rebel group deny Kerr's accusation, saying his decision shows his government lacks interest in the Rome peace process. For VOA News, Waki Simon Wudu reports from Juba. In his New Year message, President Salva Kiir had suspended the Rome peace talks until further notice. Kiir accused the whole out groups of not adhering to a ceasefire agreed on in 2020. The government and several groups that did not sign the 2018 Revitalized Peace Agreement have been meeting in Rome since 2019. But last October, the talks stalled and so far the process has failed to silence guns in parts of the country. In his New Year address on Saturday, Kir said the parties had made some positive steps in the peace talks and his government was prepared to engage with them last October. The president said the talks would resume when, quote, they are ready to hold the genuine talks with government, end quote. Some of the holdout groups said Kir's decision indicates the government's lack of interest in the Rome peace process. Pagan Amum, head of the Really SPLM, describes the latest development as unfortunate. The government and the non-signatories of the revitalized peace agreement, the group that they refer to as all out groups, are in disagreement and the purpose of the Rome talks is for the, these two parties to sit and talk, negotiate to find a solution to the problem 
to the crisis in South Sudan by addressing the root causes as they agreed in the Rome Declaration. Therefore, when we have this crisis, if the government is serious, they would not suspend their participation, they would not create obstacles, but rather sit with the non-signatories in the wrong process. Amom says the parties were expected to start negotiations on key issues, including reviewing why the implementation objectives of the revitalized peace deal could not be reached by next month as planned. One to focus and discuss why the transitional period has failed to achieve peace and transition to democracy, and why all the transitional periods, we had had five different transitional periods, five different transitional governments. Why have all these transitional governments been dysfunctional? Amom denies Kir's accusation that the holdout groups have been destabilizing the country. Colonel Philip Deng is the spokesperson of the South Sudan United Front, one of the parties to the Rome peace process. To be realistic, government itself is the one always attacking our forces across the country, intended to be used by them as a window to suspend the Rome peace accord. So we are not waging a war or not ready for peace talk to resume as asserted by President Kiir. However, should President Kiir give another room for the resumption of the Rome peace initiative, then our high-level negotiating team will report themselves to Rome. Amom says the peace talks are intended to define the causes of the country's political problems of governance and establish a solution. In 2021, President Kiir also suspended the government participation in the talks, citing the same problem. Amom says so far the two sides have not begun negotiations on the real issues. For VN News, I'm Waki Simon Wudu in Juba. Ivory Coast says it sent 46 soldiers to Mali to provide backup security for the UN peacekeeping mission. But Mali branded them as mercenaries seeking to undermine its security and they were sentenced Friday to 20 years in prison. The proceedings were held behind closed doors and under heavy security. Three women and soldiers who were among the original group detained in July, who were freed in early September, were sentenced to death in absentia. The court proceedings came in the run-up to a January 1st deadline set by the West African leaders for Mali to release the soldiers or face sanctions. An agreement reached last week between Mali and Ivory Coast leaves the possibility open of a presidential pardon by Mali's junta leader, Asimi Goita. You're listening to African News Tonight on The Voice of America in Nigeria. Violent crime, long-running insurgencies and communal clashes have left many people feeling very insecure. In October, the United States government ordered the families of its diplomats in Nigeria to leave the country because of security fears and warned Americans against travel to the country. The British government and several others also warned against visiting Nigeria. VOA's Kate Bondawson spoke with Mark Dirksen, a researcher at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies, who studies Africa's rising urbanization and the security and other challenges that presents. He began by giving an overview of the problem. Insecurity in Nigeria is um, a really uh, significant issue currently. Um, I think that the situation hasn't been great for a while now, but has um, even deteriorated in the last um, couple of years. Um, but I think it, it's important to realize that, um, you know, the, the situation isn't uniform throughout the country. There are specific corridors where um, there are different armed groups operating. There are different um, security threats. Um, that said, um, there is um, kind of a generalized uh, precarity throughout the country. Um, People are struggling economically. Um, people are um, wondering what is the future holds for the country. 
Um, and there is a lot of tension um, around, especially around access to resources. Um, so there, we're seeing a number of, of clashes around um, of land um, driven by um, population growth, by environmental degradation, um, around um, government corruption, around how land is allocated and used. So between 2020 and 2021, um, communal violence around land and water access, um, pasture, um, violence around um, access to those resources um, more than doubled um, over that span of time. And that trend has continued um, over 2022, um, staying about at the, the same levels as 2021. So it really is, a, um, you know, Nigerians are, are very concerned about uh, the insecurity um, that they read about in the news, about kidnappings, about um, farmer herder clashes, about banditry. Um, and then, um, but it, meanwhile, um, actually in the, the northeast of the country, um, the, the violence um, associated with uh, Boko Haram has actually decreased across 2022. Um, so as I said, you know, the situation isn't um, the same across the country. There are pockets where insecurity is, is very um, uh, extreme. Um, and others where, um, you know, things might actually be improving. But that said, it is a, a concern that Nigerians have. Um, and it's reflected in, I think, um, the uh, approval rating polls that they have for um, President Buhari, which have trended downward since he was reelected in 2019. Um, now it's about 65% disapproval. Um, so there really is, I think, a, a sense that something needs to, to change and that um, a new strategy um, needs to be introduced. Now, let's talk about the elections. There have been attacks on election uh, commission offices. There have been attacks on some political party offices. Is the violence a threat to actually being able to carry out those February 2023 elections? Yeah, that's that's a, a real concern. Um, I mean, there's there's this hope and this optimism around the election that it's um, a chance to um, rewrite the narrative for the country, to re-strategize, to bring in new, fresh policy thinking around insecurity. But then, so you know, there's actually um, uh, over 11 million new voters registered. Over 84% of those are under the age of, of 34. So there is this um, groundswell of of um, kind of uh, energy around the election, but then there's also this this concern that the election itself could be um, a source of insecurity. The Electoral Commission has been working very hard to you know, reassure people to um, put in place security around polling stations. Um, there have been some promising signs from the gubernatorial elections um, in Akiti and Oshun state um, over the past year that those had lower levels of violence and went off relatively smoothly compared to it the past. So I think that there there is hope that that, that is setting the, the trend for what we'll, we'll see in February. That was Mark Dirksen with the Africa Center for Strategic Studies here in Washington. He spoke by phone with my colleague, Kate Pondawson. And uh, Reuters says at least 20 people have been killed and dozens injured in Somalia's breakaway region in Somaliland. The deaths took place over several days as security forces clashed with protesters in the town of Lasakandu in Somalia's east, which is disputed between Somaliland and Pontaland, a semi-autonomous region of Somalia. The protesters are demanding that Somaliland cede control of the town of Pontaland. They also accuse security forces of failing to end insecurity in the town. Pontland's vice president, Ahmed Elmi Osman Karash, accused the security forces of violence. The commander of the Somaliland army has not responded to the criticism. Somaliland broke away from Somalia in 1991, but has not gained widespread international recognition for its independence. And that wraps up this edition of Africa News Tonight. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib in Washington. For all the latest developments on the continent 24-7, visit our website.